Shock! Statistics revealed yesterday that bottled water is contaminated with plastic. Over to Kai for the report. Yesterday, the news broke that 90% of bottled waters contain microplastic particles, making it potentially less safe than tap water from, for consumers. Researchers claim these fragments small enough to pass through your body could have got there during production or because human plastic addiction has led to small particles entering the water chain. To find out more about the facts and dangers, I'm now joined by Dr. Olorental to find out more. What do you think about the microplastics in the bottled water? Uh, it's probably not a very good thing if, uh, if they found that there's microplastics in water. How many microplastics do you think are in one bottled water? Uh, depends on the size of the water bottle, but also uh, and the size of the microplastics. But there could be uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of these tiny uh, microplastics in there, which could go on to possibly cause harm. How much can one bottle of water cause? What, harm? Yeah. Um, one bottle probably won't cause much harm at all, but you imagine that the amount of water that we drink out of bottles, uh, and that could build up and up and up, and could eventually cause us some problems in the future. Fox hunting has always been a controversial subject. Here with both sides of the argument is Daisy. Twelve years ago the Hunting Act was put into force, and in 2005 MPs voted 356 to 166 to ban hunting with dogs. The Act banned the hunting other mammals as well as foxes. The act came into force on the 18th of February 2005. People have now started to drag hunt, which is when you hunt down a person with a scented rag. Now the Prime Minister wants MPs to have a free vote on whether to repeal the Hunting Act. People think it is cruel to hunt and the way they kill living animals with the dogs is barbaric. They do not want the animals to suffer like they did before. However, many people disagree. I am here with Evie to find out why. So, what is your view on hunting? I think that many people like hunting and I personally enjoy it, but I think that sometimes people held at the idea of that the animal gets killed at the end. So, do you hunt yourself? Yes, I do. Why do you hunt? I hunt because I think it's a fabulous way to interact with other people and other horses and make new friends. Was there a certain reason you started hunting? I started hunting because my mum used to do it when she was younger and I've always wanted to Try and do everything in the riding. If the fox hunting ban was lifted entirely, how would it affect you and people you know? I don't think it would affect, affect me fully because I think that you could hunt in different ways, as such as a fake scent, and other people I know, I don't think that they would mind either because they can do the same. OK, thank you for talking to us today, Amy. In July last year, the Prime Minister backed away from the promise of overturning the fox hunting ban saying there would not be a vote held until 2019. In entertainment news, an exciting World War I drama production is coming to Bodmin. Over to Kai for the report. A unique project, The Trench, between Bodmin College and the Cornwall Regimental Museum and a theatre company, Collective Arts, will bring World War I back to life as audiences from Bodmin will be able to become and walk, among, and walk amongst ghosts from the past as part of the 100 year celebrations in early summer 2018. Audience members will participate by being enlisted at the Regimental Museum. They then travel to the front line by steam train on the Bobman and Wenford Railway. We are joined by Hannah Irwin who works for Bobman Railway to find out more. Okay, first question, what would you call your job? So, my name's Hannah Irwin and I'm the Visitor Events and Marketing Manager for Bobman and Wenford Railway, which is a steam heritage railway and a visitor attraction. Um, and we run trains and hold lots of different events. So I look after the marketing and promotion, so getting people to come along, and then their experience when they're at the railway, so um, the type of thing that they get to see and do. Um, and then also things like our shop and our cafes as well, so a real mixture. Okay, um, what made you want to do this project? So I think the Trench Project was a really exciting and different thing for us to be involved in. It's not something that's happened in Bodmin before, so that was great to be part of something new and also something that was going to involve lots of different people in different ways. Um, is there anything that could potentially go wrong? If so, what could it be? Gosh, that's a scary question. Um, you know what, there probably are 
quite a few things that could go wrong. So we're taking people um, using the steam trains out along the railway. Um, and when you're working with 100 year old steam engines, sometimes things don't quite go to plan, um, but hopefully it will. Um, and also because we're taking people out into the field and into a trench, um, that's possibly a little bit challenging. Um, if it rains and gets really muddy, it'll be even more of an authentic experience of being in the trench, but uh, that might be a bit challenging too. What do you hope to achieve from this? I think it would be brilliant if we created a piece of performance and, and an experience that was incredibly memorable for people. So I think what we want to do is get people excited about coming along and then um, make sure that they go away um, you know, with lots to think about and feeling um, like it's kind of affected them. Maybe um, people might be quite emotional about it, um, but mostly kind of think, oh, wow, what a, what a brilliant thing to have, to have seen and been part of. What would you like the audience to, to gather or learn from this? So one of the things that's really brilliant about the project is that um, lots of research has happened to find out real stories about real people from Bodmin who uh, went off and, and fought in the First World War in, in the trenches. So I think um, a bit of kind of personal history about um, you know real people and, and, and their lives and how, how they were, were affected, I think I'd like people to kind of understand a little bit more about that and have something to go away and think about afterwards. Is there a lot of people involved in making this idea a reality? There are lots of people. So um, there's organisations who've given some funding to the project so that it could happen. So Heritage Lottery and the Arts Council and an organisation called Feast. And then there's the, um, the kind of the lead organisation, so the theatre company and then the Steam Railway and also the Regimental Museum, who are the, the locations and the main partners. But then there's all sorts of people doing research, um, people who will be performing, um, students from the college who are going to be involved in terms of um, making a film and also performing, um, designers, uh, people doing food, um, and then all of the audiences who, who come along as well. So lots and lots of people um, kind of in and coming to Bodmin um, who will hopefully uh, be really uh, excited about, about the project. There are many stories and descriptions of the infamous Beast of Bodmin. Here to discover the truth are Charlie and Dylan. A big cat described as being similar to a black panther has been spotted in the field just 300 yards from the A390 near Prugas. The last, the least, the last report is the recent of some 60 sightings of a black panther like big cat. It is supposedly three to five feet long and sporting white yellow eyes. Combined with numerous reports of motivated livestock, the evidence was robust enough. A large black cat-like creature sighted at gardens in Cornwall could be the so-called beast of Bodmin, according to head gardeners around Cornwall. There have been lots of reports on this so-called beast of Bodmin. Furies are bound if it does exist, and many swear it does. We spoke to Danny Bampin from the Big Cat Society to get one fury. Do you think the beast of Bodmin exists? Do I think the beast of Bodmin exists? Um, yeah. Yes, of sorts. I don't think we should use the word beast, though. I think that's kind of a kind of folklore legend kind of branding, if you like. I think at the end of the day, we know that these are cats, so that they're not beasts. Um, but yeah, I do believe that there are large and exotic felines living on and around Bodmin, Moor, and also the other moors in the southwest, which which form a little triangle if you look at the map, Bodmin Moor, Exmoor and Dartmoor. Why would these cats be on the moor? Um, they're on the moor because, um, well basically, lynx, um, which is an indigenous species into Britain, um, they were thought to go on extinct about 400 years ago. So there is a possibility that some of the lynx, some people think that the lynx may have survived in pockets of West Wales and, and Scotland. But um, we do have other big cats and exotic cats, and there's a difference between big cats and exotic cats. A big cat, scientifically, is only a big cat 
if it's got the capacity to roar. So you're looking at lions, tigers, jaguars and leopards. And the only big cat that we can possibly have in the UK is likely to be a leopard and a black leopard, which is commonly known as a panther, but it's got the melanism gene. And but most of the sightings that we get are of black cats, but not all of them are the size of a panther. And um, how did they get there? They got there because people introduced them into the wild, mainly between the years of 1976 and 1981, when the government brought in the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, which was focused on people owning non-indigenous exotic animals. So whether it was a spider or a snake or a big cat, if it was non-indigenous to Britain, you had to have an, uh, a Dangerous Wild Animals Act license. Um, for it, to have it, but a lot of people didn't, didn't do that and they let them go in the wild, such as on the moors in Bodmin, Dartmoor, Exmoor, Yorkshire moors, and in West Wales. So people released these animals into the wild because they were emotionally attached to them. And they didn't close the loophole till 1981 in the Countryside Act, which made it illegal to introduce a non-indigenous species into Britain. Thank you for oh, talking to us. The mystery continues. Local news, we find out more about the legendary Heritage Day, Bodmin Beast. Heritage Day is a Cornish holiday in Bodmin, but it took a new twist in the 1980s when locals decided to embrace the local myth of the Bodmin Beast. A supposed wild big cat prowling the local moor that the nation's press jumped on. Today, though, there are few sightings of an actual beast. Locals take turn to play the part during the Heritage Day celebrations. We are joined today by Ricky, who's been heavily involved in the Heritage Day. Can you start by telling us a little bit about Bodmin Riding Heritage Day and what your role is in it? Yeah, sure. So, uh, Bodmin Riding Heritage Day is an event that happens in Bodmin in Cornwall. Uh, every year in the first weekend of July. It's a celebration of the town and its culture and its history. Um, and it's unique to the town. Uh, so the, the whole day kind of focuses around the play uh, whose central character is the Beast of Bodmin. Um, so this mythical creature who is said to have lived on the moors of, uh, of Bodmin. 